Good morning, History 1700 students. Today is day 3.3, .3, week 3, day 3. And uh, hopefully everything's clear on what to do uh, right now with your uh, obviously training your oral history research paper tomorrow and uh, starting to decide on a topic for a histor historiographical presentation. Uh, remember, s submit your uh, oral history research paper by tomorrow, your topic for your uh, topic and books for your historiographical presentation by uh, Thursday, July 16th. Uh, if you have any questions on that, uh, please let me know. Uh, I, I realized this morning that I thought a link to a video about slavery with Harriet Jacobs playing center stage was in your uh, week three short answers, but uh, it wasn't, and so I put that in today, which is a valuable resource on what I'm going to talk about today as well. Uh, that video, like I said, Harry Jacobs is the one of the central characters in that video uh, about slavery. is about 50 minutes long, and uh, also at the end of the video, about for the last 15 minutes of the video. It uh, does a great job of showing the events leading up to the Civil War. And so that's why I post that today, because it is a great resource for yesterday's topic of slavery and today's topic of secession. So I'm sorry that wasn't there previously. I, I thought it was on there. I, uh, I should have looked better, but uh, it is on there now. And it is a great video. Morgan Freeman is the narrator. Uh, I would strongly suggest you check it out, especially for today's topic, the last about 15 minutes of the video that uh, shows uh, the events leading up to the Civil War and secession. And that's what I'm going to review a little bit right now is, is those events uh, leading up to secession. I can't even say the word, secession. Um, if you remember our, our talk about how the Constitution treated slavery, uh, there was the Three-Fifth Compromise where you know, uh, uh, for for congressional representation, slaves were three fifths of a person. But also in there, it didn't mention uh, slaves or slavery. It was other persons or servants, you know, stuff like that. But and then remember, the founding fathers knew what they were doing. Uh, they even admitted they were letting future generations decide the slavery question. They just did what they could to appease the South to get the uh, Constitution ratified, passed, and uh, they knew that future generations would decide what happened with slavery. And they were exactly correct. So about 30 years after the Constitution was ratified, uh, in 1820, came the Missouri Compromise. I think I've mentioned this before. And the Missouri Compromise uh, was Maine coming in as a free state, Missouri coming in as a slave state, that's kind of the balance there, but took it a step further, saying that the southern border of Missouri, which was called the Missouri Compromise Line, southern border of Missouri all the way to the Pacific Ocean, that would be the place where slavery could exist. Uh, so that set the set the limit of where where slave slavery could could exist. That was the appeasement for the time. It uh, worked okay, I guess you could say. But then uh, in 1848, I mentioned this as well, just to review, uh, with the aftermath of the Mexican-American War came the Wilmot Proviso. Never became law, okay? It was just uh, something that was uh, put out there. Uh, it said that there would be no slavery in the lands acquired from Mexico, again, in the, in the aftermath of the Mexican-American War. Never passed. Uh, but raise those sexual tensions again. Okay, just two years later, 1850, uh, came the Fugitive Slave Act. Okay, because California was coming in uh, to the Union, 1850, as a free state, there was no slave state coming in to balance the power. And so, to make up for that, they passed the Fugitive Slave Law, which said that uh, a a so-called fugitive slave could be apprehended 
and uh, sent, as the saying goes, back down the river with, uh, back into slavery, uh, with, uh, and did not have any, any recourse, really. Uh, could not defend themselves, uh, uh, and uh, it was basically a sentence back into slavery. Uh, and there were a lot of people, okay, a lot of free blacks in the north, who were sent back, sent into slavery, uh, because these headhunters were were just uh, wanting to get these people ten bucks a head, uh, and ignored their documents saying that they're free, and sent them again, like I said, back down the river to slavery. Uh, it happened all the time. Okay, uh, the 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 movie Twelve Years a Slave, and actually this guy is mentioned in the in the video I just talked about, uh, Solomon Northrop. He was one of the free blacks in the North who was sent uh, back into slavery. Uh, it happened all the time. It was horrible. Uh, the next next thing that happened was the uh, Kansas-Nebraska Act, 1854, which nullified the, the Missouri Compromise and said that states coming into the Union uh, had the choice whether they would be slave states or free states. And this caused some tension because uh, especially in Kansas, you know, it's, it's called Bleeding Kansas. You know, there's one group who was pro-slavery in Kansas, one group who was anti-slavery in Kansas, and uh, each wrote their own constitutions, uh, and it came to a head in 1856 with uh, John Brown, the fiery abolitionist, uh, just hacking uh, uh, pro-slavery uh, 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 pro -slavery groups. Uh, pro-slavery people, I should, I should say, uh, and that was called Bleeding Kansas, 1856, and some historians say that that is the real start of the Civil War. Uh, Kansas eventually came in as a free state, uh, just to, just to know, but uh, that, again, that act said that uh, slaves could decide whether they came in as free or, or uh, slave states, so kind of interesting there. Uh, three years later, 1857, uh, the Dred Scott decision, uh, Supreme Court decision, uh, this Dred Scott decision, just a quick background, this slave named Dred Scott was a slave in, I believe it was Missouri, uh, and then his owner moved him to, I believe it was Wisconsin, and so he said, hey, I'm in a free state, Wisconsin, I am now free, right? And, uh, yeah, went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the, uh, <clears throat> the it was a five to four decision, I believe, uh, and it went on, you know, basically southern and northern lines. There were, if I remember right, okay, don't quote me on this. There were more uh, southern southern justices in the Supreme Court, and so it went that way. Uh, but basically, the decision said that uh, blacks, uh, having had no rights uh, uh, under the the political system, could not be part of the political political. Uh, uh, family, it said, in the U.S., uh, but also uh, Congress was powerless uh, in, uh, you know, saying, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, Congress was, was powerless in uh, saying whether, uh, oh, God, hold on, I know this one, <laughs> it's been a while, uh, oh, God. I'm drawing blanks. Sorry, right. I'll if if it if I remember it, uh, I'll, I'll go back to it. But the big the big thing was, blacks had no rights, couldn't be part of the political family of the United States, and that was that was huge. And, and the North was decrying the decision, obviously, uh, being anti-slavery in the South, obviously liked the decision. And then I mentioned this uh, with the Mexican American War uh, thing, uh, election of 1860, Democratic Party was split, uh, North and South. Uh, Breckenridge, uh, the southern wing, uh, Stephen Douglas, the, the northern wing, uh, <coughs> Abraham Lincoln was the Republican uh, uh, candidate, and again, like I said, with the Mexican-American War uh, video, uh, that uh, the big tenet of the Republican Party, which started in 1856, and that is today's Republican Party, a big tenet was free soil, meaning slavery should not be expanded. Uh, and uh, so Abraham Lincoln was obviously uh, uh, part of that, and he did not want slavery to expand. But the South saw that as 
against everything they stood for, slavery and white supremacy. And so they saw Lincoln as, as a leader who uh, would not uh, go towards what they stood for. And so that, that's when the, the secession started. Uh, in December of 1860, yeah, December, it's December 1860, South Carolina secedes. Six other states follow, and by February, if I remember right, uh, had formed the Confederate States, uh, Conf the Confederacy, uh, Confederate States of America, and whose t whose tenets written in the Constitution was right to white supremacy, uh, slavery, and then uh, six other states followed a little bit later, uh, and uh, uh, Lincoln knew the war was coming, didn't want to fire the first shot, uh, resupplied Fort Sumter. Uh, and uh, shots were fired. It was a bloodless battle, but uh, and that was April 12th, 1861, I want to say, and that's what started the war. Uh, was the you know these Confederate states seceded from the Union? Felt like uh, they their uh, what they stood for was not going to be heard with this new president who did not want to expand slavery, and uh, that's that's you know the events that led up to it. Um, so the the reading this week uh, is uh, <clears throat> excuse me uh, a few textbook sections with you know little different uh, takes. Uh, one is a textbook from uh, 1959, and then the other is a textbook more recently, uh, just to see the comparison. Uh, but the the biggie is a Time article that that came out. Eh, it's been nine years. It was the on the anniversary of the start of the Civil War, uh, but it. I love it because it talks about it's historiographical, showing how we view the Civil War right now, and uh, one of the things that is, is is important in it is it it says that there are a lot of people who don't remember and don't and just sweep under the rug the real causes of the Civil War, which clearly was slavery. You know, some say it was states' rights. Yeah, you know, states' rights over could we have slavery or not? Uh, but even Abraham Lincoln himself, and it's quoted in the in the article, is slavery is uh, the reason we're, we're fighting this war uh, and uh, interesting that that it was swept under the rug and even the the governor of virginia at the time in a an event uh commemorating the 150th anniversary of the start of the war didn't even mention slavery uh, at all um, and especially as one of the causes and of the civil war and that is that is very interesting that is a travesty that uh, people either forget the history or just sweep it under the rug. And this is something that's hotly contested going on today. Should we remove these Confederate monuments? Uh, you know, some would argue it is whitewashing history. Others would argue, hey, we need to remember this part of our history and learn from it. And I, <clears throat> I this is my own opinion, I fall into that category. Hey, leave these up. Okay, leave, <clears throat> leave those, those monuments of the Confederacy up. And uh, I read an article, oh sheesh, it was been a year or two ago, where uh, a professor of history said that instead of tearing down these monuments, we should, you know, there's the original plaque that's there commemorating who this person was, you know, whatever statue or this Confederate event. And, we, and this professor said we need to put another plaque on there saying, hey, this, this happened, we're not proud of it, but we need to learn from it and move forward. You know, basically that kind of stuff. And I agree wholeheartedly with that. Uh, and that, again, that's my own opinion. But uh, hey, you decide. Should we uh, tear down these Confederate monuments, or should we uh, keep them up as a reminder of some of the less savory aspects of our history? And uh, again, James James Lowen going back to that nationalistic, patriotic approach. You know, the textbooks sometimes have a tendency to sweep. The, these less savory aspects under the rug, and uh, I, speaking of which, uh, on your week week uh, week one day three, uh, reading about the Constitution. No, sorry, that was about the Revolution and Declaration of Independence. There was a reading there that was uh, from the 80s, Cornerstones of Freedom, and it, this is this is the interpretation that I got as an elementary student of the Revolutionary War and the Declaration of Independence. It is a dripping patriotic. Uh, a nationalistic approach, and uh, I forgot to uh, give you a preview of that reading, and I put that reading in there uh, specifically because it was that nationalistic patriotic approach that 
that uh, James Lowen was was uh, uh, saying in his his book, and I forgot to uh, uh, mention that 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 is the whole purpose that I the whole reason that I put it in there. So I apologize for that. I've I've gotten a few uh, people saying, why do you have that source in there? Well, that's why I forgot to to mention why I had it in there. So just just a note, okay, just a note. Uh, I want to give you varying perspectives of history, and that's what I was trying to do, but I forgot to, to give you the preview of it, and I try to give you a preview of all the readings uh, that you're going to do. So anyway, if you have any questions or concerns, let me know. Again, get your, uh, your oral history research paper in tomorrow. Uh, get your historical topics and books, historiographical presentation topic and books by next Thursday, and then obviously your regular short answers and discussion board. Uh, tomorrow as well. I will be. I'll have a lot of time today to to grade. Hopefully, I can get uh, pretty much caught up on grading. Uh, so just be patient with me, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. And signing off until next Tuesday's Google Meet. Thank you, and have a good weekend.